Chapter 6 The Ark of the Testimony As thought-provoking and discomforting as it is to the rational-minded, the futuristic characteristics of this strange and glorious device are unavoidable. What is the Ark? Quite simply, it is a chest used for storing the most important relics. The tablets of stone containing one of the greatest gifts God ever gave man are in the ark. It was said to have held manna also, a mysterious food God caused to fall from the sky so the Israelites could survive in the desert. And in some interpretations it carried Aaron's rod and possibly the first Torah scroll. But still, there is much controversy and confusion as to what the Ark really is. Not only is the Ark used to house several important relics, but it was also used to win many battles with its awesome and mystical powers. Worship the Lord and communicate with Him. In the 1981 Indiana Jones film Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark is referred to as a transmitter, a radio for speaking to God. This is correct. Both Joshua and Moses communicated with God via the Ark, as it is written in the Old Testament. Is it a radio transmitter though? Contact. Before asserting that the Ark may have transmitter capability, it is important to realise that this is unnecessary for one to communicate with the Lord. Moses and Joshua would kneel before the ark and pray to God. This time in prayer allowed them to communicate with him. Nowadays, any man is capable of communicating with God without the need of altars or shrines. As we know this to be the case, why did Moses and Joshua use it as such? The Ark was used as a shrine, which is good for morale both on and off of the battlefield, and through prayer Joshua can communicate with the Lord via the Ark, just as Moses before him. Both would worship God and communicate with him in this way. Moses gave the Israelites the Ark and used it himself to communicate with the Lord because, despite Abraham's efforts, the Israelites still struggled to fathom an intangible presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant was God's compromise for the Israelites' inability to fathom his intangible presence. When Moses returned from Mount Sinai with the tablets of stone only to find a mob of uncleanness worshipping an idol, compromises had to be made. The Ark was just that, a tangible presence of God to worship despite being one of the commandments not to. Cunningly, the law was placed inside so the Israelites, through their worship of the law, might live by it. These are the realistic interpretations of the Ark, but unfortunately the Bible likes to go above and beyond realism in a lot of places and with my latest research into ancient Egyptian technologies, many questions arise regarding the Ark. Some of the testimonies in the book of Samuel, for instance, suggest the Ark was used as a weapon. And then there are people who suggest this communication between Joshua, Moses and the Ark was some kind of radio communication. Whoever believes in this only knows the physical realm and is attempting to explain spiritual matters with their physical mind, whereas the faithful will understand that radio communications are inferior and unnecessary to communicate with the Lord. With that being said, I do believe the Ark has some additional, more physical characteristics, but that they are all manifestations of the power of God and not technology just like the parting of the seas by Moses in Exodus. There is no explanation for this other than an act of God. Additionally, after visiting Israel and Egypt in search of evidence of advanced technologies being used in ancient times, 
All I could find was an obsession with religion and nothing else. Everything had a religious purpose and meaning, and extraordinary devotion was apparent everywhere I looked. I returned slightly disappointed, but enlightened and fulfilled with a treasure far greater at the same time. Considering the ark's design, including the inverted wings of the cherubim, a common motive depicted on many ancient Egyptian sarcophagi, and of course the fact that Moses was indisputably nurtured as an Egyptian himself. There is the possibility that the Ark was an adaptation of other ancient Egyptian shrines. This information can be found in my other book about the ancient Egyptian origins of Christianity, where I discuss the origin of the Ark along with many other unfathomable discoveries of this highly intelligent civilization. Incidentally, almost an exact replica predates the Ark known as the Shrine of Anubis, found in the tomb of the young pharaoh Tutankhamun. Researchers long believed that it was the Ark, almost matching the physical dimensions spoken by God in the book of Exodus. And then there is the holy boat of Edfu, which I had the pleasure of visiting when cruising the Nile in May 2015. This will also be included in my next book. Some records say the Ark was God himself. He was within the two cherubims and it was representing his physical presence here on earth. His power was manifested through the Ark. Again, this is due to the fact that man has desired to worship tangible objects since the beginning of creation and only really respects a physical presence of power and authority. The Ark was just that, and if anyone disobeyed they were smitten by some powerful and inexplicable force. It demanded respect, and its holy consecration demanded the respect of God. Among many other things, the Ark was an object to be feared, and even born-again Christians cannot help but consider its alternative technological advantages. King David, of all people, was afraid of the Ark, as was just about everyone else, and whoever came into close proximity with it dropped dead as if being electrocuted. The Ark as a Weapon Whatever else the Ark might be, one thing is certain in the Bible, it is dangerous. It is so dangerous, the greatest king of Israel was scared to death of it. Everyone was. The Israelites relied on the Ark to win many of their battles and called for it to be brought into a battle they were losing against the Philistines with disastrous consequences. They lost the battle, and also the Ark. But when it was captured by the Philistines, they could not wield its awesome power and were perplexed regarding the fate of this very beautiful, yet very terrifying artefact. So they moved it to several different cities, where it brought a plague of tumours and mice upon their people. Thus it was removed from their kingdom entirely. 1 Samuel 6, 5-12 The story of the Ark's removal is even more fantastic. Carried by two cows and left to its own devices, it mysteriously guided itself back to Judea, and there are similar strange stories about the Ark from other sources outside of the Bible, including the Kebra and Agast. This highly regarded ancient text among the Ethiopian people also reports that the Ark had a mind of its own, and the ability to levitate both itself and an entire caravan on their homeward journey from Jerusalem to Ethiopia following its mysterious disappearance from the Holy of Holies inside the Temple of Jerusalem. During Joshua's conquest, it was believed to be the most powerful object in the world. So powerful was this awesome weapon that none but the Israelites dared use it, but even they were not permitted. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah put forth his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it 
for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. 2 Samuel 6, 6-7 Just to clarify, God did not hate Uzzah for touching the ark, but he had no choice. It would have set a precedent. Any general would have done the same, lest there be insubordination among the troops, which then leads to disrespect. This was often the case in the Old Testament and was the reason for a lot of the smiting. The message was made perfectly clear to everyone that day. 